But I, I told my dad, I was like, Dad, I really want to go watch this LSU-Alabama football game. And he said, son, that's fine. I'll take you. Uh, but you're going to have to figure out a way to collect some cash somehow, some way, uh, to be able to buy some tickets, and then we'll all go. And so kind of looking around, I didn't know how to make money at the time, but I did know that we could pick a whole bunch of pecans and, and sell them at the, at the nearby corner store. And so I sort of went out for, you know, several afternoons after school and started putting my pecans in a five-gallon bucket. We had the big sacks to put them into. And then one of my older brothers came up to me and said, look, if you really want to make money, you're not just going to sell those pecans. And I'm looking at him like, what else would I do with them? He's like, no, you're going to sell them. But go stick them in the pool for a couple of hours. Let them go ahead and (laughs) soak up and absorb some water. That way we can increase our poundage and you'll get even better tickets because you're going to have more money for it. And I said, well, Sounds like a great idea to be. So, of course, that's what we did. Uh, and then he even taught me the lesson of, like, you blow dry the outside of the pecans and have them dry to where they don't all look wet. And so we brought those in. We had plenty of money to go to the game. And uh, and then it was probably two days later, um, my dad overheard me and my brother talking about it. And uh, it was a great lesson I learned right then and there, right, in business ethics. And uh, my dad was uncompromising about the situation. He was like, son, you go get that money. We're bringing that money right back to that store. You're going to give it all back to them. They're not reweighing the pecans, and you're starting over from scratch. I'd like to thank our title sponsor, B1 Bank. B1 Bank knows that entrepreneurs like you are always thinking one step ahead. So you need banking solutions that can keep up. It begins with lending. Does your business need working capital or financing for new equipment? How about a real estate or a construction loan? Good news. The B1 Lending Team is ready to learn your goals and help you find the best lending option available. Now let's talk about uncomplicating your daily cash flow. B1 offers a full array of treasury management services that let you collect funds faster, pay funds more efficiently, and access your information with powerful online tools. Most importantly, B1 understands the value of working with local nonprofits to build a stronger community. They believe in giving back through hands-on involvement with their B1 community outreach program because it's simply the right thing to do. B1 Bank. Be uncomplicated. To learn more, visit B1Bank.com. Equal housing lender, member FDIC. Hello, I'm Andrew McClendon, your host of the Next Entrepreneur Podcast. We're here in the Propel Production Podcast Studio in Baton Rouge, and we welcome our guest, Mr. Nick Spire, founder and president of Emergent Method. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. So uh, you've got an exciting story. Uh, Why don't we start by you telling us uh, what... Uh, emergent method is and what your company looks like today the size and the, the the breadth of your reach we, we we call ourselves a management consulting firm but i think that's a little bit deceiving when you really start to peel back the onions uh around what our firm is and and the work that, that we do our, our stated mission statement is to help organizations grow innovate improve their performance and provide amazing distinctive unique experiences to their stakeholders or or to their customers, and we do that across all sectors. I mean, our clients today are public sector, private sector, in the nonprofit world. We, you know, during the, the 2021 year, we worked with clients in 21 different states across the country. We delivered it with employees that are based out of 15 uh, of those states. And so what the projects look like, they vary very differently, right? Sometimes they're one-day engagements where we're asked to come in and facilitate a session around a very specific problem or a challenge that they're having, or we're doing leadership development work with mid-level management to multi-year large grant programs where we're helping to design both policy, do public engagement and public outreach, sort of the marketing component, uh, handle compliance functions as well, especially on federally funded grant programs, which we've seen a lot of over the past you know, several years because of the disasters that have hit South Louisiana, and then through COVID, there's been other opportunities to administer programs to try to get people back on onto their feet. So 
where we sit today, you know, we've, we've, we've basically doubled in size. It almost feels like every year since we wow. launched our firm in, in 2012, and we're sitting at 213 employees oh as of goodness. this morning. Uh, we've got two companies that are sort of rolled up. Emergent Method is what I'd call sort of the strategy, your traditional consulting firm, uh, PhDs, MBAs, you know, comms, business, and a lot of technology folks that are involved in that business. It's around 55 uh, and then we've got a second support company called Emergent Talent, and it's basically project-based staffing. It's what we do a lot of our large grant program work out of, whether it's processing applications for Medicaid assistance or disaster recovery grants or rental assistance. And so it's been... That's placing employees? That, that's, that's employees we hire as W-2s but are put on you know programs that have some finite life. Um, and so we essentially have the two-model system around how we deliver to our clients kind of based on those needs and that 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 you know arm of emergent method we call it a division uh, emergent talent it supports you know even some of our private sector clients come to us with short-term needs and short-term right. maybe three months or a year now are, like, those, are they placed uh in the your clients offices typically has been on site yeah, yeah. The covid world has changed everything andrew and so a lot of it is now being done remotely, which is neat because we have Louisiana-based employees that, you know, have its experiences on the grant management side that are actively supporting projects today in Oregon, California, Texas, Alabama, South Dakota, Arkansas, North Carolina, Vermont, and District of Columbia. And three years ago, two years ago, before the pandemic, those options, you know, would have looked a whole lot different. We may have gotten the request to provide some staff, but there would have typically been office locations that were set up within these specific places, and we'd have to go out and recruit local talent to be right. able to source those jobs. And, and yeah, in case you'd have those other expenses of travel and per diem. And, exactly. And so in order to make it affordable, you'd have to get local. That's, that's really interesting. But, to, but if you go back to our mission statement too, right, which is like our, our goal is to help organizations grow to innovate and improve their performance we sort of fundamentally had decisions to make early on in our our, our firm around were we going to be really really good and have a niche focus um, and do one or two things really really well we decided against that approach which a lot of entrepreneurs will say that's the approach you should take right. and, and the reason we did was twofold uh, you know the folks that were involved in the early years of our company we had all moved away and we all had a strong desire to come back to Louisiana and weren't real keen on getting in an airplane every single week, right, and traveling. Uh, but, but more fundamental than that is we sort of view organizational challenges. If, if you try to make it about branding and marketing or just about strategy or about process, business process improvement or just about technology, we don't think you really solve an organization's challenges, right? Especially those of us that run businesses know and appreciate you know, successful organizations are the one that not only have a great strategy, but you then have to tie together the right technology and the right processes with the right people, uh, put them in the situations to be able to be successful. And so when you when you look at our organization and our, our core consulting disciplines, I would say we're, we're a creative agency. I mean, we've got as good a, you know, design shop as, as I've ever worked with. We build websites, and, and you probably wouldn't expect that when you – immediately go to our website we've got phds that do survey and analytics that are able to pull real-time data into businesses to allow them to make decisions we've got people that are incredible at building power bi dashboards to allow both the government sector as well as private sector how do you mine the data that you have to be able to make understand historical performance but more importantly have the predictive analytics to understand where the business is going. And, and that's been what I would say I'm probably as proud of as anything, Andrew, is we've been able to, you know, build with some amazing team members uh, this cross-section of services with a regional-based firm, right, which is, which is really uncommon sort of in the space that we operate. I mean, uh, Nick, it just seems so complex and, and all the things that your business – can do and offer and, and uh, you know, for your clients that it's, I mean, you know, there's, there's building that talent uh, that can deliver on that, 
But then there's communicating to your clients everything that you can help them with, right? That's a whole other thing. So it's just so much going on there. And it, it just strikes me, you know, uh, you're a young man, right? And you, but you've, you've accomplished so much and, and you can deliver on so much, what you just explained to us. Um, but you know, like, like, like most people, when they graduate from college, they effectively know little, right? I mean, and you, you went to LSU, right? I did. I was at LSU 2000 to 2004. So, uh, uh, finance, finance. So, um, Walk us from from there to, you know, uh, to the next step. But, I mean, there was a lot of learning that just happened in, in those, uh, you know, 15 to you know, 20 years. But um, what, what did you do right after college? Well, I, you know, to be fair, Andrew, there's still a lot of times where I still have no idea what the hell I'm doing, right? <laughs> um, no, so, so it was my junior year when I was at LSU, and uh, I was majoring in finance, and I went work for an investment firm here in town. Um, and quickly realized that's probably not what I wanted to do. Uh, I got a lot of respect for the profession, but right. um, the idea of, 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 of trading and managing portfolios of other people's money was not something I was all that interested in. And, and what it felt like at the time was the only other option with a finance degree was to go sell insurance, which again, that was not you know something I you know really felt like I wanted to do. And I was watching tons and tons of my friends through LSU joined the internal audit program, which essentially guaranteed them a cool internship in some major market city, uh, primarily in the southeast, but really all around the country. And so I enlisted in the internal audit program at LSU. So I ended up with a concentration in internal audit. And, and what that did was it landed me a gig with PricewaterhouseCoopers. As an intern in Dallas, Texas, I worked for an LSU graduate named Carol Calkins, who's still a professional mentor. I know Carol. To this well. day, you do know Carol yeah. well. She serves on the B one. That's right. That she right. is. She is fantastic. She is amazing. She uh, so she gave me my start, and without without really? Carol, certainly I'm not here today. There that is, is fantastic. There is no question about it. And so had an amazing internship experience with Pricewaterhouse Coopers. Didn't necessarily love the specific work I was doing at the time, but I was learning a lot about business uh, because I, I came from a background. My dad was an ag teacher. My mom was a nurse, entrepreneurship, certainly major business was, was not sort of in our, our, our vocabulary and our lingo and in our upbringing. And so I sort of saw the opportunity to, to launch a career with PricewaterhouseCoopers. And, and, you know, if you go back to the story I just told you about all the stuff Emergent Method does today, it was during those early years at PwC I got to understand how you build a big major business, right, which we're I mean, nowhere close to scale or size there, but you start to understand why a firm like PwC would offer everything from tax services to advisory services to audit services because you, you know, they're certainly wanting to meet the challenges of, of businesses. So had an amazing internship, was given a full-time offer, um, and, and obviously accepted it on the spot. During the course of my senior year, there was a huge engagement that was getting started in, in Atlanta uh, that they were looking for a bunch of, you know, especially young associates to join. Carol reached out to me, wanted to know whether or not I was interested. I learned a little bit more about it. And it was Delta Airlines uh, that had completely outsourced their internal audit function to PwC. So there was a huge team in place there. And this was right after the en Enron and you know, some of the other major corporate fraud, health south, et cetera. Um, so Sarbanes-Oxley was just a huge deal uh, within publicly traded companies at the time. So moved to Atlanta, um, joined that firm, received an amazing training experience for the first month. They sent us to professional spring break in Dallas, uh, which was great. Everybody's just out of college and you're learning during the course of the day and you're having a lot of fun in the afternoon. But began to build a professional network and some of the folks that I met there are still involved in my life today, including I swear I met my wife. Uh, oh, okay. was there training with with Pricewaterhouse Coopers. And so when I was at Delta Airlines that first year, I watched them ultimately file for bankruptcy. And uh and it was during that time I sort of moved out of the internal audit practice, got more into traditional finance and management consulting work. Uh, where I was part of a team that, you know, not only did the preparations for the initial bankruptcy filing, uh, but immediately following that, we began to do a major assessment around where can we save cost and increase revenue. And I was focused more on 
reducing cost side. And so historically, every five years, you're, you're, you're required as an airline to basically tear an airplane down and rebuild it. Um, and so that had historically been done in Atlanta. So we went through some major outsourcing initiatives. And so I was part of the team that did the financial analysis. But then really what led me to the business we're in today is, you know, I, I moved ultimately from the you know, the consulting practice to a practice within PwC called People and Change, uh, which is how do you manage large-scale organizational transformations, right? I mean, Delta Airlines had to completely and fundamentally shift the way it was going to do business, and folks managing a function with line union workers in Atlanta that were now going to get outsourced to Guadalajara, Mexico. I mean, these managers have to be completely retrained and retooled. So did you feel like you were drinking from a fire hose at, during those years? Yeah, I had no idea what I was doing. I had zero yeah. idea. I mean, it was fake it till you make it kind of, you know, circumstance and situation. But just learning it at, at a rapid pace. Absorbing, working tons of hours. I um, mean, those are, those are big, real-world uh, business problems you're, you're talking about there. Right, and, 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 and not to glorify it, right, my job in those early years were – I was making meeting agendas. I was taking meeting notes. I was making sure the coffee was in the right place and the room <laughs> was set up. But it was it was those intangibles and those skills, and I think my willingness to do the administrative task that allowed me to get in rooms and to be part of meetings that maybe some of my peer class at the time wasn't doing. And and you know, it's one of the it's always been one of the things that I've had. Andrew is this huge chip on the shoulder about being from Louisiana and growing up in a little Cajun town. And it, which was where Opelousas, Opelousas, yeah, Opelousas in Port Barry, and but the family's kind of from rural St. Landry Parish, and uh, and I think it was my ability to work, roll up my sleeves, and work hard, and not yeah. get outworked by anyone, allowed me to overcome maybe you know what may be perceived as other challenges where I had a degree from LSU, and I'm working with peers that had degrees from you know quote unquote you know more prestigious universities, and uh, so no, it was just a. It was a great experience, and, and, and that people and change work that I did with Delta Airlines then opened up my next big opportunity within PwC was to actually move up to New York, spend the better part of a year. Um, my generation was joining PwC, and we were not comfortable, right? We collectively were not comfortable with the model a big four accounting firm had, right? For years or decades, they were able to rely on, let's go hire a young CPA with a master's degree fresh out of school, show them the path to partnership. And if they're really, really good, they're going to stick with us 13 years. We're going to lock them into the partner track. Once we lock them into the partner track, they're going to be here and make an entire career out of it. You know, our generation was a little bit more impatient. We weren't quite willing to follow that same traditional model. And, and, and PwC was seeing massive amounts of turnover, and they were really smart and strategic around how do we think about altering and changing our operating model uh, to continue to be able to deliver for our clients but provide, a, you know, a unique experience for its, for its team members. And so PwC partnered with, with Stanford and Harvard. They came up with multiple operating models that they wanted to actually test in the real world, uh, the biggest of which I helped implement in the New York area where historically in those major accounting firms, you know, a partner was compensated based on his or her book of business and the profitability of that business, um, which I certainly understand as an entrepreneur and I appreciate and I get it. The challenge there was, you know, sometimes you weren't making decisions in the best interest of the long term of the firm when you're just focused on growing, you know, your own book of business year over year. And so we created portfolio teams. And again, I didn't come up with the model and I was working with a bunch of smart PhDs and change management, but, but being able to see just how hard it is to move the needle and make large scale organizational transformation where instead of a partner's compensation being based on his or her book of business, it's actually being based on eight partners collective book of business, the employee satisfaction scores, across all those eight partners and all the team members that they now have pulled together to deliver to those clients. And then the scores back from the client around the performance of that team as well. And so it began a major shift and, uh, and it was fun to be part of those, you know, those in those early years, I was, I mean, even that point in time, I was five years into my career, Andrew, and, you know, you're working with, 
you know, 50 year old partners that have been in the business a long time. And they rightfully would look at me and say, what the hell do you know, kid? And I didn't know a whole lot, Um, but I was trying to learn and absorb and, and soak it all in. So no, it was just a, I I look back fondly on my PwC years. I learned so much during, during that time. So you had a health challenge along the way. I did. Yeah. That, that first year at, at PwC, I mean, they did a great job taking care of their employees, and they were pushing employee wellness and go get an annual checkup and an annual physical. And at the time, my mom was battling stage four breast cancer. And, and so for whatever reason, you know, going to get a free physical sort of caught my eye. And uh, so I went in and did the physical. Uh, and the doctor was like, why are you in here? Like, I mean, you're young, you're healthy. I never really see anybody your age. Do you have any issues, whatnot? And uh it was during that time he felt a lump on my neck. And uh, so he asked me about it, and I said, I had no idea. I'd never felt it. I don't see it. And uh, after a series of tests, yeah, I, was, I was diagnosed with, with papillary thyroid cancer. Wow. And so what did that involve, removal? It did. Total thyroidectomy, neck dissection. It was in the local lymph nodes. But, you know, as I say, if you're going to pick a cancer, papillary thyroid cancer is one of the better ones. The five-year survival rate's really high. It was an anomaly for a young white male to be when getting that papillary thyroid disease, but they took it out and then I ultimately did chemotherapy, which is a little misleading though. Thyroid cells are the only cells in the body that absorb iodine. So my chemo treatment involved me sitting in a room, someone walking in dressed up in full lead materials with a huge mask on with this big lead cylinder that they open up with this bright fluorescent purple peel. And they tell me to swallow it, drink some water, run back to my apartment and not see anybody for 10 days. Oh, my goodness. Um, but the good news about that was because thyroid cells are the only cells in the body that absorb iodine, you don't have a lot of the other negative uh, oh, challenges see. you have with most, most chemotherapy treatments, certainly, you know, 20 years ago. So um, how long did that impact your getting back to work? And- I, was, I was out for about two months um, in the May-June time frame. Uh, sort of following surgery and then getting ready to do that treatment. And then six months later, um, it involved me having to take a little bit additional time off when they ran additional tests. I mean, I'll say it. I mean, I, because I had no thyroid, when they ran these additional tests, they they, they removed me from the, the, thi- the thyroid supplement that I do take every single morning. And so it felt like I was on a six-month hangover. Yeah. Uh, that's essentially what it felt like. Yeah. Yeah, so my wife had uh, a, a similar condition, and, and then my uh, two youngest daughters, uh, actually, no, my two oldest daughters, um, uh, had that same uh, uh, gene, and they had their thyroids removed. So uh, they were doing the uh-huh. daily uh, medicines as well. So, um, But that comes back, that part of your story comes back a little later ask you about your community involvement and um so how but we'll get to that in a minute how long did you then work at uh price waterhouse so i was there better part of five years and uh that was when you know my wife and i were looking to start a family and i loved i loved the lifestyle i loved the job but that's certainly not the the lifestyle or the job to have yeah. based on where I'm from and based on the way Abby was raised as well. And so we started looking around and, uh, you know, it's, you know, my story cannot be told without these amazing connections of LSU people after LSU people really taking care of me, Andrew. Yeah. And it was Jerry Jolly, uh, somebody that you may very well know who ultimately served on the board of directors of KPMG. But I mean, he's a legend around here, particularly in the public accounting space. And so I reached out to Jerry um, and said, hey, Jerry, I'm ready to get back home. I had had befriended his son who was working for KPMG in Atlanta. And yes, Louisiana, us LSU people kind of stick together. Uh, So I had met Stuart up there and Stuart, you know, I met Stuart's dad through all that, those experiences. And so I talked to Jerry about potentially joining KPMG, but the challenge there was going to be I could base out of Baton Rouge, but most of the work in the field I was in would have required travel quite a bit. Um, he actually connected me then to Bill and Christelle Slaughter with SSA Consultants. And so when I learned about the work that they were doing, particularly in the government sector and the Louisiana focus, I was certainly intrigued and then ultimately joined that team um, in early 08 and, uh, and had a great experience there. Um, that was We just had Christelle on the podcast. Yeah. Fantastic individual. 
she's great. Yeah, no, and I certainly owe a, a lot to Christelle in terms of you know my professional and personal growth over the years, and uh, got to work with some amazing people while I was at SSA, including some incredible clients. Um, I often like to tell this story. My first meeting on my first day when I was with SSA was with uh, Garrett Graves, not Congressman Graves at the time, but uh, but this was just a couple years removed from Katrina. Um, and Garrett was considering taking over the head of the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, which was, at the time, there was legislation in place and there were some basic funding mechanisms, but the organizational structure that those of us in this space now know as CPRA didn't exist at the time, um, and so was involved in, you know, again, a what I like to call a, a, a gover- uh, 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 organizational restructuring um, but doing it within the confines of civil service and within the confines of the government sector, but was was part of a team with Christelle and then certainly with all the leadership of of uh, now Congressman Graves and his team to help create the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. Fantastic, brilliant man. Um, so why don't we take a break right here, Nick? And when we come back, let's pick up when uh, the start of Emergent Method. Perfect. We'll be right back. We would like to thank MBD Automation for their support of the Next Entrepreneur podcast. MBD Automation is a mechanical install contractor with a program-centric focus. So what do these guys do? They install conveyor systems, VRCs, platforms, singulators, sorters, and all sorts of other types of automated equipment. Who do they work for? They work for systems integrators, manufacturers, and end users in fulfillment centers, airports, mail processing facilities, and projects in the defense industry. MBD Automation works for numerous Fortune 500 companies across the United States and has a list of international clients that they perform work for in the U.S. as well. If MBD Automation can help you on your next project, you can find them online at mbdautomation.com. And we are back with Nick Spire, president of Emergent Methods. So uh, before we actually get into the start of that business, I did mean to ask you uh, if you're entrepreneurial as a youngster. Yeah, I don't think that I was, but now that I've become entrepreneurial in my adulthood, I do look back to a couple of childhood examples where maybe I did, you know, at least demonstrate some of the skills and attributes. And the first one that comes to mind was sometime in the middle of the 90s. I was a big LSU football fan. My dad was a ag teacher, you know, kind of at home body in, in St. Landry Parish, crossing two bridges to get all the way to Baton Rouge. wasn't something he loved to do. Uh, so I didn't grow up coming to LSU football games, but I, I told my dad, I was like, Dad, I really want to go watch this LSU-Alabama football game. And he said, son, that's fine. I'll take you. Uh, but you're going to have to figure out a way to collect some cash somehow, some way, uh, to be able to buy some tickets and then we'll go and so kind of looking around I didn't know how to make money at the time but I did know that we could pick a whole bunch of pecans and, and sell them at the, at the nearby corner store and so I sort of went out for you know several afternoons after school and started putting my pecans in a five gallon bucket we had the big sacks to put them into and then one of my older brothers came up to me and said look if you really want to make money you're not just going to sell those pecans and I'm looking at him like what else would I do with him he's like no you're going to sell them but go stick them in the pool for a couple of hours. Let them go ahead and soak up and absorb some water. That way we can increase our poundage and you'll get even better tickets because you're going to have more money for it. And I said, well, sounds like a great idea to me. So, of course, that's what we did. Uh, And then he even taught me the lesson of, like, you blow dry the outside of the pecans and have them dry to where they don't all look wet. And so we brought those in. We had plenty of money to go to the game. And, uh, and then it was probably two days later, um, my dad overheard me and my brother talking about it. And uh, it was a great lesson I learned right then and there, right, in business ethics. And uh, my dad was uncompromising about the situation. He was like, son, you go get that money. We're bringing that money right back to that store. You're going to give it all back to them. They're not reweighing the pecans, and you're starting over from scratch. And uh, so, again, just a, a funny sort of Louisiana story with yeah. a real-life lesson that, that my dad taught me. The The second story was, you know, I went to that first game, fell in love with it, and I'm like, you know, Mom and Dad, we really got to get season tickets. These were in the DiNardo years. 
And so we ended up with three tickets in the, the southwest corner of the end zone. And uh, mom and dad would take us for a couple of years. But then once we got into high school, we had friends that were gone, and we were able to then drive to some games. So I started hustling tickets at these football games where I'd take our three that we had as a family and I would sell them, and then I'd convince somebody to sell me their better tickets for an even lower price, and I would just move tickets throughout the course of the day and end up oftentimes sitting on the 50-yard line. And, uh, of course, I never gave any of that money back to my mom, never gave the original money back to my mom. And it was at my high school graduation at a party um, that one of my friends told my mom, was just like, you should see your son in action at these football games, hustling and buying and selling tickets. So my mom didn't tell me anything about it until the very next year when football season was starting. I was like, hey, mom, can you send me the tickets? She was like, oh, I canceled those. I'm like, what do you mean, mom? And she's like, well, you were making all this money off of it. I wasn't getting any of it. So you went ahead and lost your season tickets. You're going to have to sit in the student section and start back from scratch. So <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, I had a friend of mine I went to the game with one time, and he did that. He started with a, a, a cheap ticket. And during the day at tailgate, he just kept trading That's up. It was fascinating to watch. So I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. So, um, at what point in your career did you start to determine, like, hey, I gotta, I gotta start my own gig? And what did that look like? How long did it take? So I don't, I don't think I ever had that moment. Quite frankly, um, I was presented with a really unique opportunity um, in the 2012 time frame, uh, where I had just been involved in a major project with the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority where I had moved sort of out of the business consulting role and was doing a lot of public communications, community engagement work, helping that organization develop its coastal master plan, which involved, you know, it involved engaging with a very diverse group of stakeholders from oil and gas to the uh, environmental, um, you know, community to, you um, fishermen, um, as well as sort of just, you know, a broad spectrum of, of low to moderate and vulnerable communities throughout coastal Louisiana. And the oil spill, uh, the BP oil spill had occurred sort of in that general time frame right. as well. So there was a ton of money that was about to come to the state to do large-scale ecosystem restoration to the tune of, you know, billions of dollars, which is critical and much needed to sort of change the trajectory of where we are as coastal Louisiana. And so... I was part of a team that helped develop the idea and the model and the concept and then ultimately launched the Water Institute of the Gulf, uh, which was led by the leadership of the Baton Rouge Area Foundation and certainly Governor Jindal and Congressman Graves now and former Senator Landrieu. I mean, there was just an incredible group of people from all sides of the aisle coming together saying this is not just going to be good for Louisiana and solving our problems, but the problems we have here in South Louisiana are going to be the problems of the East Coast and the West Coast and all around the world in years to come. Um, and so the Water Institute of the Gulf was launched in kind of late 11, early 2012. The very first CEO of that organization was a, you know, somebody that, a professional colleague of mine who then became a dear friend of mine, Dr. Chip Grote. And he presented me with an opportunity to join his team. And um, I wish I strongly considered, but it was at that moment where I realized I, I get bored easily. Andrew, I do, and I love new problems and new challenges, and so I knew that was going to be a short-term solution. Right. So it was really over the matter of a couple of days where kind of came up with the idea maybe this could be the way I start a company uh, and start a business, and uh, and we were able to make that happen, and that was the start of. It was Spira Consulting at the time. I wasn't even that creative, didn't even think a whole lot about it. Uh, so we launched Spira Consulting in the in the summer of 2012, and that's really how we got started. And, and of all the success and all the accolades we've had over the years, um, the thing I'm probably most proud of is those clients we had in those real early days with the Water Institute of the Gulf and the Coastal Protection Restoration, Restoration and Authority, they're still our clients 10 years later, right? Uh, when we slowly started building a team of folks and John Snow came on a year later and Anthony Napolitano came on a year or two after that, the clients that they brought with them and the clients that they first engaged with on their very first days now nine and seven years ago are absolutely still our clients today. And to me, it's those stories and those relationships that I was most proud of. But no, it wasn't this master plan. It wasn't. It just sort of happened and uh, yeah, felt like the right thing to do at the time. 
So you've gotten a lot of accolades for your growth, a lot of recognition. And, um, you know, I was thinking about that. I I suspect there's uh, a lot of pros that come out of that, a lot of advantages as it relates to employee morale and recruiting. Uh, I suspect you're not the kind of guy that, you know, finds his way on those lists of fastest growing uh, just for the sake of the recognition. Um, but can you talk about, is that my perception of that uh, accurate as far as the benefits that come from that recognition? We struggle with it as we sort of look at every one of those applications, quite frankly, Andrew. And, and, and it's interesting. There's a part of our team historically and probably still today loves the idea of growth, right, and wanting to be a regional player and potentially a national player. There's also something really, really cool about the six and seven and eight of us that were in a little small office above Azteca's Mexican restaurant in downtown Baton Rouge um, just five or six, seven years ago as well. Um, but so growth for us has not been about the accolades, but it's, it's been a means to an end, right? If you go back to like fundamentally, and, and this was not the case in 2012, this sort of evolved through our strategic planning processes over the years, we tried to figure out who do we want to be and what are we going to look like and what services are we going to provide, is for us to create the kinds of opportunities we were hoping to create for our team members. Growth was a necessity. I mean, it really was, right? right. Like, how do you, how do I take a, a you know, a young uh, graduate of MassCom in 2013 as an intern, right, and then work with her to get an MBA and get promotions and to be able to support projects and manage projects, the only way to do that is to grow. And uh, so that's really been the means to the end. And then the second the second piece about growth has been, you know, when we build these incredible relationships with our clients that are built on sort of real trust and, and hopefully at least an appreciation for the value that we add, they inevitably come to us and say, hey, do y'all do this? Um, and whether the answer is uh, whether or not we actually do that, right. you know, the, the answer is oftentimes, yes, we can do that. We can. And, and so that has allowed us to really grow. But with that growth has been in our, our ability to really deliver to our clients in, in, in much larger ways than we would otherwise. Yeah, so, uh, you know, if you look at uh, a, a graduate and they, they're looking at their opportunities I would think that a firm like yours, it has a lot of recognition uh, for success and growth would be appealing. Uh, and therefore, um, maybe you don't need any more you know, awards on your wall or trophies on your shelf, but um, that, does, is that, am I, it, am no, I it, on to that? I mean, is that it, legitim- it legitimizes the business, certainly, and especially yeah. now that we're trying to compete on a, on a regional and a national scale, right? I mean, look, you know, we, we've got to overcome the challenges associated with being a firm based out of Baton Rouge when we're in Raleigh, North Carolina, right, or when we're in Austin, Texas. And so those, those accolades and that recognition by, you know, national and international publications like Consulting Magazine and, and like, you know, the Inc. 5000 list. I mean, all those things become equally important. But the awards I actually prefer to see are the ones that, you know, Tracy Bennett and Therese Walker on our team just received from Consulting Magazine being considered some of the top 30 rising stars in the consulting profession around the world. Wow. And um, and so those are fun, right? But, but, but those occur because of the growth we've had. It's how we were able to bring them on. Yes, I was going to ask you if uh, you subscribe to Richard Branson's theory. If a client asks you if you can do something, the answer is yes, right? Almost all the time. Yes, so, I mean, when you look at the, the, the breadth of the services that you offer and, you know, and want to continue to offer, uh, the, the real question is, could you manage that skill set and deliver on that even if someone's not in-house with you today, right? Yeah, and, and that is the tough part, and that's the – but. But the thing, I mean, like as I sit in the seat today and sort of view where we are, Andrew, I mean, the thing that's most rewarding and most gratifying are the teams that some of our folks within our team have now built. And I don't really know what they do. I don't. I don't yeah. The specifics of how we deliver it and what all the skill set is, 
Um, but we've essentially built many businesses within this other business. And, uh, and now to see the integration occurring from our folks that do technology implementation with our folks that do disaster recovery work with our people that do public sector strategic planning, it's those synergies which now allow us to offer solutions to our clients, which historically we didn't even know existed. Um, and we're beginning to make those connections. So I was curious, um, in the services that you provide, involves innovation as well as strategic uh, planning. And those two words uh, seem to have a, an interesting relationship to me. I was curious if you could explain what those words mean to you as it relates to the services that you provide your client. And is, is it a chicken and the egg thing? Does one come before the other or how does that work? It's like, that's a great question. And I'm sure there's a lot smarter people than I that have written books specifically on that topic. If I think about strategy and strategic planning work and I think about innovation, right, I'm, I'm a fundamental believer if you're staying the same, you're falling behind. And so to me, innovation is about changing. It's about continuing to evolve, to understand where markets and sectors are going and making sure we're going along for those rides. And so we want to be involved in that strategy work. Andrew, what the way I rather almost communicated to our clients regarding, you know, where we think we're at our best is when we're not only focused on strategy, but we're focused on action, right? And so it, there's a lot of great firms out there, multinational firms that can come in and tell an organization based on the best research that's out there, what they need to be doing and why there's a value proposition for it. Those organizations at the end of the day don't build the kind of relationships I think that we build with our clients, which where we want to be in the trenches with you, not just during the strategy sessions that we're having now, trying to figure out how we're going to innovate, but actually helping you do those exact same things. And so, because uh, ultimately one of our taglines is about strategy action and then results, right? And if we work for a bunch of organizations that are not successful, that are not improving their performance, guess what? No one's going to hire us, right? Because you you go to our client list right now on our website and see all the organizations we work for. And if those organizations aren't doing great things, then you sure in the hell shouldn't hire us, right? Because we're inevitably involved and we truly believe this. Our success is completely dependent upon the success of our clients. And it's been... It's been one of the major mantras that we've had and something probably that I harp on with our team and train with our team more than anything is that at the end of the day, we will always be successful. We fundamentally believe this, Andrew, if, if our clients genuinely and fundamentally like us, right? We don't need to be the smartest people in the room, right? There's a lot of really, really smart people out there that can't build great relationships with clients. And all of us want to work with people we like first and foremost. Right. And I want to work with people that not only I like, but that also like me. The second thing is our clients got to fundamentally trust us, right? They've got to be able to feel confident enough that they could tell us anything. Uh, and it's going to stay absolutely between the two of us. But, but at the same time, they've also got to be able to trust that when they call us, which occurred this holiday, just like it occurs every holiday, when they call us on the Friday before a major holiday, when everyone's trying to check out of the world uh, with a major challenge or a major, you know, opportunity that we're not only going to answer the call, but like we're going to figure out a way as a team to come together to ultimately deliver. And then once we're given those opportunities, yeah, we got to add value, right? So yeah. that's what we talk about. Our clients have to really and fundamentally genuinely like us, trust us and value us. And if we do those three things, I mean, the numbers take care of themselves. The The business sort of takes care of itself. And so that's been our focus every single day, are we doing those three things really well? Because we think those are going to move the levers more than anything. Yeah, very cool. Uh, you talk about, uh, you know, don't hire us to tell us what to do. Let us ask the right questions and the best ideas will emerge. Correct. And that's, that's where your, the origin of your company name it uh, is. came and from that, right? And I've got to credit Philip Lafarge, who was one of our early employees, uh, of our firm and part of our leadership team and was instrumental in our growth. But yeah, he helped us develop the name and, and develop the brand. And I'm really proud of Philip and the legacy he left, not just with our firm, but it's really cool to watch him. He's off on his own doing independent consulting. He still partners with us, but he's now built his own client list as well. And, and seeing his success has been really, really neat. But yeah, that's what it's about. It's like, put us at the table don't expect us to tell you what to do. Y'all are the real experts in your industry. 
but through these processes, ideas will emerge, and then we'll help you figure out how to get them done. So how do y'all do business development? It's mostly referral-based. It really is. And our focus is on how do we deliver to our clients today. Um, and it's relationship-based. And uh, but in, so, in, so in other words, everyone's a business development person. Uh, every, every client-facing. You would hope everyone thinks about it, right? Yeah. I mean, some people are better at it than others, certainly. But, but in our business, I mean, there's some consulting firms that will go out and hire folks that do pure business development, Right. And, and, and if you have a, to me, in my mind, if you have a business that sells something that everyone specifically understands, then it's easy to have a business development person go sell that. What, what we do is we don't want it to be commoditized. We don't want it to be cookie cutter. We don't want to be defined as an advertising agency, so. as a marketing firm, as an IT firm. We want to be solved as, pro- we want to be, you know, viewed as problem solvers and, so the idea and concept of having anybody else other than the folks that sit across the table from their clients, make promises around what it is we're going to deliver, is involved in the actual ex- execution on it. I just think it's unrealistic that they could appropriately represent what it is we try to do with our clients. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, Nick, let's take another quick break, get a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. We would like to thank Modus for their support of the Next Entrepreneur Podcast. Who is Modus? Modus is a facility services company that works in the e-commerce fulfillment industry across the United States. What do they do? They like to say they take it from the conveyor to the dock door. But what does that mean? It means that they're building the pick stations with the cable management. They're installing guardrails and bollards. They're putting down floor marking. They're putting up aerial signage. These guys build fencing systems, shelving systems, and racking systems. They also do rack recovery for when there's rack failures. They also install dock levelers and dock doors. Modus also installs ASRS systems, which is automated storage and retrieval systems, as well as other robotics projects. They've worked for the largest e-commerce retailers in the world, and they can work for you. If you need to find Modus, you can reach them online at modusmoves.com. And we are back with Nick Spire, president of Emergent Method. So, Nick, a lot of companies around the country are dealing with uh, the great resignation. A lot of employees uh, exiting the workforce and making moves. It seems like you guys have had that opposite uh, situation where you've been growing tremendously, as we've mentioned several times throughout this conversation. I was curious how you uh, have built your culture and maintained your culture through that extreme growth that you guys have experienced. It's something we work on every single day. Yeah. And, and and we hope, you know, more times than not, we're doing the right things to continue to reinforce it. But yeah, you're right, Andrew. When the, when the, when the pandemic hit, uh, we were right around 50 employees and, and now we're north of 200. A couple of things we learned, right, is uh, we, we really focused in those early months on the health and wellness of our team, and then how do we recreate the ways we felt that we had previously built culture um, by having a firm, right? And you've heard the, the statement before is we don't want to be a firm that has beer in the fridge, right? We want to have a firm that folks want to sit together after the work day and all go get beer out of the fridge and drink it together. And uh, and that was really difficult in those early days of COVID. And uh but we did it. We embraced the virtual model. We became best friends on Zoom. And every Friday, we would have some sort of an entertainment uh, venue join us, whether it was music or a trivia deal. And Friday afternoons, we would still get together and have a beer as a team if you were able to, to sort of do that. And uh, and I think we were able to weather that storm during those COVID years. What we've now seen, right, is it's completely changed the workforce. And it's sort of flipped the chair completely and to tie, kind of tie it back to the PwC model, right, where PwC needed to evolve and grow with the way they were managing their business, uh, we completely had to do the exact same thing. My lead graphic designer and 
and creative person was looking to move to Houston. We had a very strategic decision to make. Do we let her move to Houston? She was based in Baton Rouge, right? We had another graphic designer interested in moving to Austin. Do we let that happen? And then what are the long-term implications of it? Our PhD policy researcher wanted to move back home to Sacramento, California. And in all those cases, we said yes. Um, And once we said yes in those instances, then we had to be consistent as a firm. And as we we went to source and acquire new talent, we were okay hiring developers based in Asheville, North Carolina, and Flat Rock, North Carolina, and comms professionals based in, in Oklahoma. City and so, before we knew it, whether we liked it or not, you know, we became a virtual based organization. And while we still have a home base in downtown Baton Rouge, we've had to completely retool how we use Slack and use you know Zoom and and other ways to pull the team together. But as a company, we then also said, look, there's a lot of operating costs that we're saving through this virtual model. So. Everybody that works for the company, it doesn't matter where you are. When we do our company crawfish ball, you're flying in because I need you to come experience Louisiana and like who we are and why we love this place. Um, When we did our holiday party this year and our strategic planning session, it didn't matter where you were, we're flying you in. And it's now through those moments and those events and those memories that I think we're able to continue to build that sort of culture. I think folks within our business too are they're really drawn to the problems we get to solve. And you know, if you talk a lot about the why, right? I mean, our why isn't about the growth and the reward awards and, and and the accolades. It's about you know we had you know 115,000 people across the state of Louisiana impacted by the 2016 floods, looking to get back into their home, and we were able to be part of those teams to be able to do that. You know, we've been able to work with local governments all across the state, provide much greater transparency to where the money goes, right? We get to feel really good about that. I mean, our team's involved in solving the largest ecosystem restoration problem in the world that's impacting countless coastal communities. I mean, I've got team members, Therese Walker and and Keisha Morrison today that are down in, in Plaquemines Parish engaging with those local communities trying to figure out what what scaling and adapting is really going to look like for those communities. And so we try to talk a whole lot about our why, and we try to create the flexibility for our team members. It's not how many hours you work, but it's about how productive you are. Um, and and are you delivering and adding value? And, and I think we've been really, really, you know, successful to date on it, but it's, we know it's something we're going to have to continue to work. And how do we, how do the inside jokes from the, you know, the original sort of five or six that we had, how do we create now the inside jokes with 100 people through the virtual world? Because those things matter. I mean, it's those connections and those relationships that are so critical. What I, what I will also say here as well is our HR director, Rachel Carocio, is the best in the business, hands down. She's the GOAT. Um, and... During the course of the past, you know, year and a half, she has focused every single day on what do we need to do to support our employees? When are we sending door dashes? Are we providing special recognition? Like, what are, what are the things that we're doing every single day to make sure our team members know that they are welcomed and appreciated, and, and that we create an inclusive environment? And and our best places to work scores that we kind of go through that process every single year, Andrew. We were up. Eight, nine, ten percent across the board in every one of the major metrics, and uh, to me, that's what I'm like really proud of was yeah. was being really high relative to previous years in a consulting business, which you know the history of us, right? I mean, we're churn and burn. We don't work forty hours a week, and we don't. I mean, we work fifty, sixty, sixty-five, seventy hours a week. We don't work on easy tasks. I mean, we work on incredibly complicated deals that stress us out. I mean, the, the work doesn't go away, right? When you know, because for anybody in our business, if, if you think you can check out at the five or six o'clock time frame and not think about work to the next day, you're just kidding yourselves. Um, because we've got to constantly be thinking about how are we going to approach tomorrow and how are we going to continue to add value? Because our reputation today is being generated by the things we do or don't do. And uh, so this is not an easy business. Uh, it's a tough business, and when I go through recruitment spills, you know, I often feel like it's my job to convince people not to come work at Emergent Method because I want to make sure everyone that joins our firm fundamentally want to be here, right? Yeah. I mean, our stated vision statement is not to be 
the top consulting firm or the biggest firm. It's to be singular, unequaled, and extraordinary. Like those are our expectations every single day. And not everyone wants to live up to those expectations. And I feel even as I sort of look to the future, my job, I think that the most important thing that I have is to make sure we've got a team of folks that are all pulling their own weight, right, that are all high achievers. I think Nick Saban's fundamentally said it. High performers fundamentally do not get along with mediocres. (laughs) And mediocres fundamentally don't get along with high performers. We have a team of high performers. And if we allow mediocrity to set in that culture we've built, right, it's gone. It's done. And then our ability to then generate the kind of reputation we need with our clients, our business development models completely turned upside down and so um not to say it's perfect by any stretch of the imagination we have tons of problems and and things that we work to fix and address every single day but those things have been fun well look it's uh, it's the first time i've met you but it's easy now for me to understand the accolades that you and your company have received Uh, one in particular uh, stood out to me uh, a recent one where you were uh, the first ever uh, recipient of the outstanding Young Alumni Award from the E.J. Orso College of Business. <clears throat> and uh, tell me what that meant to you. Well, I, I think it's probably the last time in my career I'll ever get called young, Andrew. So, you know, <laughs> I'll go ahead and take that because uh, I don't feel that way these days uh, very much. No, look, it was a tremendous honor. The, the best part about that night, though, and, and about that award and accolade was me being able to personally thank the people that got me to that spot, right? They got me to where we are today. Yeah. Um, and it's, <clears throat> yeah, it's the Carol Calkins, it's the Jerry Jollies of the world, it's the Bill and the Christelle Slaughters, it is the countless number of LSU alums that we get the opportunity to do business with. It's our first client in Chip Grode. It's, you know, it's all these folks. We just would not fundamentally be here without them and then it was a great way to celebrate with not just our current team but but team members that have come along for the ride that may not be with us anymore Seth Irby and Julie Laparus and Philip Lafargue but then celebrate with our new team members like like Tim Basilka that was what that moment was all about and so there's something a little bit embarrassing about the personal recognition because it's just one of those deals where I would rather take my name out put it on the company because you know, just like our company's success is only, you know, is dependent upon the success of our clients. My personal success is only dependent upon the success of our team. Talk about the uh, role of community service uh, in your life and in your business. I think it's critical, right? I mean, we, we have to give back to the communities that have now given us so much. And, and that was instilled in me by my parents at a, at a very young age. And and certainly reinforced every step of the way with every organization I've ever worked with, right? I've been really proud to work for organizations that have invested back in the communities with with time, talent, and treasure. And uh, so obviously with my connection to cancer that we discussed earlier, I was able to get on the board of Cancer Services when, when I didn't even really understand how nonprofits were structured. And over the years, it's been really important to me and, and now honored to serve on boards like the Baton Rouge Area Foundation, like the LSU EJ Orso College of Business Dean's Advisory Council, like Women's Hospital as well, and and what's great about it now is I learn so much. Like I I don't we don't have the PwC type training. I now get to learn incredibly complex organizations by sitting as a board member, which I think at the end of the day will make me a much better consultant. Which is why we really encourage our team to do the exact same thing. You're going to build again great relationships. I mean I. You know, I got to meet Raphael Crawford, who's president of one of the biggest businesses with, within Albemarle. I met him by serving on the board of of Cancer Services, and so he's a guy that I do an annual ski trip with a year. Like, he's a personal friend. He and I fundamentally like each other, but we also get to do business together, and that connection was made, and that's been the best part. Our firm also, right, you know, a lot of the very small projects we take on are – for nonprofits here in town, where we'll deeply discount the rates that we would traditionally charge, to, especially to a, a public or a private sector client. But again, we get to feel good about the impact that we're making, whether it's working with LASM on a recent strategic plan with them, but we've, we've worked with countless, countless nonprofits in this city. And that work is, it's fun, it's meaningful, it's rewarding. Our team members truly appreciate it. And we've got the mantra, right? Like, if not us, then who? 
Um, and so we just think it's really important to do those things. Yeah, it, it is, and you're doing a great job of it. Uh, as we wrap up, why don't you uh, paint a little picture of the vision that you have for Emergent uh, five, ten years down the road? Yeah, we, you know, we talk about it a lot, and we, we're just coming off of our sort of three-year strategy session. It's it's hard to imagine five to ten years from now. I mean, just the world changes so much. And in every step of the way, we'd have been dead wrong with what we would have anticipated we wanted, which is, which is great for me to now know because clients are always bringing us in to do strategic planning. We'd have missed the mark every single time. But the planning process is still right. incredibly important. I think now given how we've embraced this virtual model and, and talent really spread out across the southeast, but even across the country, um, the kinds of inroads we've been able to make with our Louisiana clients, I am incredibly optimistic we're going to do the same thing in other sort of regional-based markets. And I want to be seen as a, as a real regional player with real brand recognition, with a solid reputation in areas – kind of, you know, especially capital cities from here up to Washington, D.C., and kind of focused in the southeast corridors that I really want us to be active in Montgomery, Alabama, and Jackson, Mississippi, and Atlanta, Georgia, and Nashville, Tennessee, and build on the work we're doing in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. And so whether that's, you know, you know, you know, focusing in a virtual world and building relationships with local partners or it's going – our talent uh, within those markets that we may already have some connections with or that we get referred to is that I really kind of want to start to take our business and, and scale. And again, no special number in mind. I mean, I, and I'm okay if we're even smaller right. while we're doing that. Uh, but I do think we have just a, you know, we've got a great model and we've got a great team and, uh, and I want to test whether or not what we're doing here and what we've been able to now begin to do across the country, whether or not can keep, keep growing and scaling it. Well, Nick, uh, it has been a true pleasure talking with you. You're a brilliant guy, and um, and I just am so impressed with with uh, you and your operations. So continued success in all you do. We appreciate you coming in. It's been my pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. I really enjoyed that conversation with Nick. He is such a super smart guy and a brilliant communicator. And I love his stories, you know, that coming from Louisiana with the chip on his shoulder, uh, you know, out to prove himself against the Ivy Leaguers. Uh, I love his story about uh, as a young boy trying to get to an LSU game. And then that full circle uh, of him making it to LSU to go to school, to graduate from there, going out in the world, proving himself, then getting back home, having all his LSU connections, and ultimately getting... Uh, recognition from the E.J. Orso School of Business, uh, where he also provides service. Um, you know, Nick has done a tremendous job where a lot of companies were struggling during the pandemic. Theirs has grown tremendously. And uh, I love his sense of community and the importance of that in his life and uh, in that of his business. We really enjoyed the conversation. We appreciate him coming in. We appreciate you guys watching. We'll catch you next time. We would like to thank our title sponsor, B1 Bank. They can be found online at b1bank.com. The Next Entrepreneur is produced by Propel Productions. You can find more information at propelyourstory.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the Next Entrepreneur podcast and hit the bell for notifications. You can also follow us on social media. The links are in the description below.